I'm going to go ahead and start. And for um, I think I have um, met everybody either for the first time or um, have met before. So this is sort of the first meeting um, since um, Wayne's departure, because we were having a little bit of trouble getting people together during the summer. Um, so welcome. And um, we'll, uh, we've got, I sent out the agenda. We've got some um, catch up to do, but I think first thing I'd like to take a uh, public comment, uh, actually first note, of course, that this is being recorded. So if there are other people that want to review this later, it'll live on um, Northampton Open Media. Um, for anyone who misses the meeting and wants to see it either now or in the future. Um, so is there anybody um, who wishes to speak about something that's not on the agenda? Uh, I would, Carolyn. I don't think we've met. Um, my name's Damian Watson. I live at uh, 61 Liberty Street in Florence. Um, and I'm just, uh, would like to propose uh, an idea or a, I don't know what you would call it. <clears throat> I am generally unfamiliar with these settings. So uh, um, forgive me for my ignorance here. Um, so uh, there was at one point some crosswalks down near in front of Faux Boston. Uh, those crosswalks have long since worn away. Um, there is uh, what I see firsthand, a relatively high level of pedestrian traffic down there, as you, as those on this call may or may not know, there is a lot of, there is a lot of families, a lot of young kids. There is now that Valley bike station down there. And technically right now, there is no way to get to it without crossing a road, which has an extremely dangerous blind corner there where the speed limit is 20 miles an hour as posted, but I very rarely see people going the speed limit. It's usually 35 or 40 coming around that corner. Um, and uh, that's basically, I just wanna kind of propose that someone takes a look at uh, some solutions there. I don't know what the solution is. Um, you know, it's a very complicated uh, corner there. Um, as I understand it, there may be some future development um, kind of between the uh, where the bike uh, kiosk is and um, where there, uh, where that gun shop used to be. There might be something built there at some point. Um, but long story short is it'd be great if we could safely cross the road from our Bay State neighborhood to either the um, cutlery building and or the Valley bike kiosk. That's all. Thanks, Damien. Really appreciate that um, bring, you bringing that forward. Uh, I'm familiar with that intersection, and many of the things you said ring true to me. Uh, I am curious about what can be done there. Okay, um, and I'm going to drop off this meeting because I am feeling really <laughs> under the weather, and I have to finish up some work. So um, uh, I will possibly see you guys in the future. Thank you. Well, thanks for popping in and we appreciate that comment. And um, we it's definitely right up the alley for discussion. So thanks. Very, very good. And thanks welcome to back everyone anytime. Here. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Um okay. So um why don't we um we can put that um comment on um, for discussion later in the meeting um, or, um, and I, I, cause I don't have any information about the crosswalk markings and why they may not have been restriped. But the next step we have is um, I, um, Donna, do you wanna go ahead and talk about the traffic calming issues on Spring Street? Okay, hi, good morning. Um, yeah, so what I would like to do um, and what I had mentioned some time ago um, is that I would like to take some of the traffic calming requests that we hear at TPC and um, kind of 
turn them over for a discussion to this committee um, to see if folks have some ideas about what we might be able to do. So um, we have a traffic calming request for Spring Street. Um, and Spring Street, as many of you know, was recently resurfaced. Um, and back in 2021, we reviewed collision and speed data. So I just want to start out by, um, and I apologize, I'm on my cell phone due to some technical issues here. So hopefully everyone can see me and hear me okay. Um, and if not, please yell. Um, okay, so collision data. Um, so we took a look at five years worth of collision history on Spring Street. There were seven total collisions during a five-year period, one in 2016, two in 2017, two in 2018, one in 2019, none in 2020, and one in 2021. Um, two of the collisions involved deer crossings in the evening hours. Two others involved vehicles backing out of driveways. Um, and what, you know, what we try to do is we try to like put patterns together or see like, are there particular places where we're having collisions? Um, Cause then we can sort of focus our energy there. So unfortunately, you know, when we're trying to look at this, all of these collisions occurred in different places on the roadway. So it's not even like we can sort of put these together um, and, and ascribe any sort of location or particular cause. Um, but the most alarming thing to us is, is that um, we did analyze 17,107 vehicles for speed. Um, and what we found is that um, we've got uh, speeds of uh, actually over 40 miles an hour. So this is a posted 30 mile an hour speed limit area. Um, and what we're seeing is speeds of 40.3 miles an hour. So. Um, this is actually why we are bringing this um, particular problem to this committee. Um, you know, when we resurfaced the roadway due to its width, we did not have the ability to install any sort of bike lanes or even shoulders. I mean, the road is only 24 feet wide. So we, we just have a very, very tight um, area to work with. So it's not like you can sort of stripe this up and, and make, you know, bike or pedestrian facilities. Um, so, so anyway, what I want to do is just kind of open this up for discussion, um, ask folks what their experience might be on Spring Street. Um, and, you know, it, just see if anyone has any ideas about, um, you know, what, what we could, um, bring to the table here that might improve the situation out on Spring Street. So happy to take comments, but um, just wanted to throw this out there as a discussion topic. Well, I guess I might jump in. And that is, um, we've, this committee has talked about reducing speeds generally. I have uh, advocated and talked to Wayne and I know it's not easy, but to have a lower speed limit citywide. So this is not addressing specifically Spring Street, but my kind of um, perspective is that um, we have a bunch of ad hoc kind of solutions, which may be okay, better than nothing, but we need to start uh, kind of looking at the big picture. And I think speed in general is a huge issue re related to safety. And uh, so I don't have any uh, uh, ideas for that, except to say that um, also crosswalks in general um, uh, and other things like that, that the, the former speaker mentioned uh, need to be uh, looked at, I think, more holistically. So um, I just think anything that uh, we can think of to reduce speeds uh, is something I would uh, advocate for, and and I don't I don't know I'm not that familiar with Spring Street, but when you repave a street, uh, it, it, people start driving much faster because it's smoother, and it's uh, it's a, more like a highway. So that's all I have. Nick, 
Yeah, I would also build on Michael's comments. Um, Donna, I, I appreciate you bringing this forward and those numbers are very disconcerting in terms of those speeds because we know that that is an area that has a lot of bikes um, there, there, and there's also a moderate a number of pedestrians um, in that area, just because we have the fields in that area, we have the community gardens um, not 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 too far from there. Um, and so I would uh, urge us to be kind of thinking holistically as there is that, you know, um, um, you know, other opportunities in those areas, because I think that 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 speed is really inconsistent with the kind of shared use of cars and pedestrians and bikes. Um, Angie? I think Brett, Brett had a comment first. No, no, Brett has no comment. Okay. <laughs> no, I have got plenty of comments, but go ahead, Angie. <laughs> um, I was just gonna kind of provide a little bit of like historical stories that I've heard about Spring Street. And, um, and it's kind of amazing to me to hear from uh, Donna that it's only a 24 foot wide street um, because that means if any car is parked on it, there's even less room. And, you know, so you would imagine it would be slower speeds on the roadway. But um, what I've heard from residents on that street when I think this has come up before and maybe some encouragement has been given to them to just park a car in the street. They don't wanna risk damaging their cars. Um, so there's other ideas of like, are there ways to put cars in the street, parked in the street um, that maybe have less value for people? Um, but I know that comes into issues too. If you are using an old car that's uninsured, it can't actually be parked in the roadway. Um, so maybe there's, something there in terms of adding more um, kind of things like that into the roadway to, to narrow the, the amount of space that there is for cars. I've seen that recently on, on Nonantuck Street, right as you get down towards the high school, I think there's like a big, someone's truck that they've been parking in the street and it really does have to, it really does slow you down. Um, they're, I think maybe intentionally so have parked their commercial truck um, outside of their house. So I think it's an effective method, but you have to have some willingness to um, put in an obstacle that might get damaged. Thanks, Any and sorry, because, yeah, sorry, because I'm on my phone, I can't really see if anyone else is um, looking to talk. So sorry, Carolyn, I didn't mean to. Um, nope. Jump in. Go for it. Yeah, I, I was actually, other raised hand. Yeah, I was just going to provide a, a another comment. You know what happened to us on Spring Street is we had a particularly bad winter a few years back, um, and the road actually blew apart on us. Um, for those of you who remember. Um, it, it was actually, uh, um, there were sections of it, the, the particularly flat sections with poor drainage, um, it actually were almost down to dirt. It was so bad. Um, and, you know, so, so when we came through to reconstruct the roadway, um, obviously we were, we were trying to uh, improve the surface, um, improve the drainage, you know, when you're dealing with a really tight footprint like this and, and 24 feet just gives you like not a lot of flexibility. I, I mean, there's just really nothing you can do with that. I mean, even things like curbs take, you know, six or eight inches, um, you know, double yellow center line, that's, you know, at least 12 inches just to put a double yellow center line in. Um, so, so we just don't have a lot of space to, to sort of build out any type of facilities on this road, whether it be, you know, a shared use lane or, or, or rather, you know, a bike lane or, or some sort of, you know, pedestrian sidewalk or walkway or whatever. I mean, we, we just had like no elbow room. Um, so that's, that's kind of the struggle and, and that roadway, um, you know, even though it's narrow and very windy, um, you know, and we deal with this on a lot of these more rural roads out on like Glendale Road, for example, which which actually has 10 foot lanes in some section. Um, you know, we have terrible speeding problems out there as well. And what we find um, to build on Angie's comment is that you really actually need to put like a physical thing in people's way to slow them down. 
Um, you know, what, and, and I know there's been a concerted effort on Nonatuck Street to do that, to have folks actually park on the traveled roadway um, to create like a like a physical blockade. Um, so, it, you know, given the speed here, um, you know, I, I don't know if we want to entertain the possibility of um, uh, speed tables, um, you know, which can be very controversial. Um, so we'll throw that out as like a physical thing in the roadway that will without a doubt slow people down. Um, you know, that's one solution. We could entertain um, the solar speed limit signs, you know, that like flash your you are going this fast to you. Um, we've put up a couple of more speed limit signs out there, but again, the speed limit's already posted and people aren't reading the signs. Um, and these are regulatory speed limits, um, so not discretionary on the city's uh, part. We have no ability to alter that speed limit without um, a very expensive engineering study. So, um, so anyway, just a few comments to sort of continue the conversation. I don't know if anyone else has got any thoughts. Brad has a comment. Yeah, so I ride this, I ride Spring Street weekly uh, with my pedal people work. And obviously I am riding somewhat slowly most of the time, uh, except for when I'm full and coming back, back down towards the fields, in which case I'm moving a good deal faster. But I've had a lot of people, I've had multiple times where people are passing me, you know, I'm riding and I'm taking a good deal of the lane and people are passing me. And it's just crazy how they put themselves in danger and the oncoming traffic in danger. And they're, you know, I've never seen anything super, super close, but, I raise my eyebrows, you know, almost every week. Um, I've had cars pass me too close to me where I can touch them. Um, so it's real. Um, I am curious, Donna, if you can break out the speed data in terms of direction on Spring Street or if it's an aggregate. Um, th this is just a report I get back from the police. Um, what I can do is follow up with the chief and ask her if she has like direction of travel or more specific right. information. This is just sort of summary data that she collects and sends to us. Um, so I'll see if I can get a more detailed report and, and right. uh, e email it to folks. Also, uh, location of that collection could be useful too. Uh, obviously... Yep coming downhill is probably going to be the faster uphill is maybe a problem, but maybe not as much of a problem. Um, and I, I, this may not be a popular comment, but I, I don't want to get stuck completely into thinking that because the roadway is a certain width, we cannot extend that width. We could, but it would be very expensive. I'm not advocating that, but I don't want us to to limit our thinking necessarily. Obviously, in in the scope of what we can control uh, soon, yes, we're very limited. I don't think I have more comments at this time, but uh, I'll keep thinking. Yeah, and and I'll just add that um, that you know our our right away is obviously a, a fixed width, um, and you know if we were to say okay, we we want to increase that right away, you know we would get into like an eminent domain situation, um, or you would get into a situation where you're sort of encroaching um, onto property, and then the city um, you know has to pay for that and engage in a legal process. Um, so that's, that's sort of how we would move outside of our property to create, you know, more robust facilities. Um, Damon Road is actually a good example of that significant uh, right away takings. It's been about a three year process there that that has been um, rather controversial. So that that's absolutely how you could expand the roadway footprint for sure. Um, before I just to piggyback on that and then Nick um, go ahead, um, but I just well, you know I think the other piece would be to consider what the point of widening is. I mean widening then 
potentially allows just to put more on the street, but then you're all expanding the width for cars and then that allows for increased um, speed. So I think, you know, a lot of that, um, even if we narrow the travel lanes within the existing 24 feet, that would, I mean, visually with um, lane markings that, um, that has a um, different approach without the extensive widening and and um not only the resources but also um you know the physical impact on the street um nick yeah uh donna oh go ahead I just, Brad. I was just um so uh, on this widening topic i don't necessarily mean widen the pavement but widen the facility so there's sidewalk along one side for a good ways and it crosses over around chesterfield road for a very short piece to the Fairway Village um, housings. Uh, what if you had sidewalk on both sides and frequent crosswalks? Maybe those would be raised tables, I don't know. But I was like, not talking necessarily more pavement, but more facilities. Check them out. Um, Donna, thank you very much for the kind of adding in as well, the uh, speed table option and the um, kind of solar powered, um, um, you know, kind of speed limit signs. Um, my experience on Jackson Street, where uh, the speed tables, I believe those are the type you're talking about, were added, which became a necessity once there was the four-way crosswalk at um, a four-way stop at um, Prospect and Jackson. Um, and the school. My sense is that that's actually been fairly effective in terms of speed reduction. Um, but again, I don't have any data on that. Um, but is that the kind of, um, you know, systems that are set up? And the second question is, uh, what's the availability of the um, kind of solar powered, um, you know, detectors? And do we have evidence as whether the, when they're on or they're off, they actually lead to differences in, in speeds? Um, I'll start with the uh, speed tables. So the speed tables are absolutely effective. They are, you know, a physical impediment in the roadway. People are forced to slow for them um, and they absolutely work. The biggest success story I would say we have in the city are the speed tables on Florence Road. Um, so right by Ryan Road, that intersection with Ryan and Florence Road um, used to have um, a, a lot of conflicts. So a lot of accidents since the installation of those speed tables on Florence Road. Um, we have seen a significant reduction in the number of conflicts at that intersection because people are actually traveling slower through there. Um, so, you know, it, they without a doubt work. The, the problem is, and, and I've had a lot of contact with the residents in the area, they're loud. Um, you know, every vehicle that's hitting these things is, you know, ba-boom, ba-boom. And the more axles they have, the louder it is. So overall, they make a difference. It's a big impact. Everybody loves it, except the people who live, you know, in a certain radius around them. And, and that becomes like sort of a quality of life issue. So, you know, ideally you have like some huge gap where there's no houses, you know, you put these speed tables in, people hit them, they make a lot of noise, and then they're slowed down, you know, for the rest of the roadway. Um, but of course, that's not, um, that, that's not the way the road is, is set up. Um, so those absolutely work. The solar speed signs, I think, are a more um, sort of uh, psychological thing, you know, where, where you'll get a brake tap from drivers. Um, you know, typically we see about three miles an hour um, but when we put uh, solar speed signs in, you know, um, people just kind of tap the brakes, you know, because they feel, you know, there's sort of like a public component to displaying your speed, like this is how fast you're actually going. So there's a psychology behind that. Um, probably not as effective as actually putting a physical thing in the middle of the road. Um, in terms of supply chain, we're really struggling with supply chain. Um, it's nearly, um, I don't want to say it's impossible to, to get things, but it is very difficult to get supplies and it is very hard to get the services to install those supplies. Um, so in terms of, um, you know, if we decided to buy this thing tomorrow morning, um, when could we install it? There would be a significant delay. Um, 
you know, I'll also mention that that re- these probably run between ten and fifteen thousand dollars per unit, um, and and then there's a maintenance component to them. Uh, okay. Um, okay, Freeman, you want to go? Yeah, th- thanks. Um, so just uh, because my name probably comes across as Winfrey. Just want to say my name is Freeman, and and the reason it says Winfrey is because my wife Wendy and I share our email. So sorry for that. Um, so we we walk. We live in Florence, and we walk down by the field and down Spring Street regularly. That section that that returns back to uh, to um, Pine and Nonatuck, and uh, definitely want to affirm that what. Uh, everybody else has reported is in fact the case. Cars are moving at a very rapid pace, especially along that stretch um, from the field back toward uh, Florence Village. And um, uh, I guess I would say that it seems to me that what Michael and what Nick have have, uh, suggested in terms of a citywide kind of examination of lowering the speed limit definitely makes sense because uh, we live on Fairfield Avenue, which is uh, a street that's off of Route 9. And um, I can say that even there on Route 9, as you enter Florence Village, uh, the speeds are very, very rapid uh, when they should not be when as they're entering, as people are driving into the village um, from straw um, all the way up through the village. And, uh, and I'm sure there are many other places as well. And I like the idea of, of, uh, of uh, some kind of table or something that would slow vehicles down. But I, I certainly think that there are other uh, solutions that might be worth considering, though I don't know what they, they might be. And I'd be interested in hearing, aside from speed tables, is there anything else that, um, Donna, you're finding is particularly effective Yeah, I mean, what's what's effective is a physical thing in the road to slow people down. But like that's that's the you know, we have a posted speed limit. People are not obeying the posted speed limit. If if we were somehow able to lower that speed limit, which we are not easily able to do, whether on a case by case basis or on a citywide basis, we repost the new speed limit. Um, and again, it's sort of just signage, you know, so, so how do we actually make people slow down? And in our experience, you know, from a public works and, and I'll, I'll even speak for planning, you know, the way you slow people down is you put things in the middle of the road to slow them down. So whether it's a speed table, uh, a bump out at a crosswalk, uh, an extremely, um, narrow lane, like we have down on Pleasant Street, um, you know, at the, at the gateway to the city now heading inbound, um, you put things, you know, a car parked in the middle of Nonatuck Street or a box truck parked in the middle of Spring Street. You know, these are things that are actually effective. Be- beyond that, I think it's just sort of like a messaging campaign or you've got a sign up that people may or may not pay attention to. Um, so that's that's sort of our vexing issue is we have to build things in the middle of the road to slow people down. Yeah, and I'll just um, jump on that comment as well. We've had an internal conversation of because there have been counselors who have um, come to us to ask about looking at a citywide, um, you know, speed limit or evaluation of how we can sort of modify that and it really comes down to um, um, those physical impediments that Donna was talking about because you know the the we, what we really want is slower speeds but again signs just don't result in slower speeds um, yeah, any other just, comments would... on this piece before we move on only to say that in the long term, there's clearly a cultural education shift that we're struggling to figure out how to make. Um, 
but in the shorter term, it seems clear that physical impediments, narrowing lanes, narrowing visions, you know, tree plantings to narrow, to, to make, to, to affect effectively narrow people's vision. Uh, these are the things that actually slow people down for now. Thanks. I, mean, I only have one other comment, which may, maybe that I could think of, maybe it's naive, but what about, what role does law enforcement play in reducing speeds? I mean, Donna has more experience with, um, you know, connecting with the police department, but, you know, it's a one-off kind of thing, in my opinion, but go ahead, Donna. Yeah, I think the, the chief is definitely more equipped to answer that question than I can, but there's also um, obviously a community conversation around policing, so um, it, I, I think that, you know, she could certainly weigh in on that. I think, um, and, and and just in terms of um, like uh, how Carolyn and I want to sort of move through an agenda item like this with the committee, we've sort of had a conversation like this. I I would appreciate it if um, folks could sort of contemplate this maybe over the next thirty days and at our next meeting. Um, you know, if if there are any comments or other suggestions for us, I, I think it, at that time we'd like to hear them and we will have a new item to consider next month. So I think that's that's how Carol and I would like to move forward with these um, traffic calming requests. Randy, you had a comment about this? Uh, yeah, I, I like, yeah, I, I ride Spring Street a lot um, on my bike. And uh, I was listening to Freeman say the especially lower Spring Street closer is where he he notices it more. I'm wondering as we consider tables, and I have a love hate relationship with um, tables. Uh, I like that they slow things down um, a lot. Um, I, possibly thinking about tables where we have potent, the potential for crosswalks. Um, in that area, which is sort of a logical place for them. They, I would suspect they tend to get painted regularly, which I think is a good thing um, on Nonatuck Street sometimes. They're hard to see um, as, as you're driving along there. And maybe a couple down, down at that end of the street where there's less housing actually, um, or one down at that end of the street. Um, so it's, it's a little bit less disturbance of uh, the thing. Maybe not think of the whole street, but think of maybe that spot um, or a couple down at that end near the field and um, the, um, uh, the, the event hall that's at that end of the street. Great, thanks. Okay, so um, next up, um, we have um, Angie. I'm glad you're here. She, um, I had, um, she had mentioned that she wanted to sort of talk about how to get the word out about the story map. Um, that I posted the link to that um, um, on our um, on this web page, and it's on the agenda for um, the manual for neighborhood safety in Northampton, sort of um, basic ideas, just sort of um, think through how we get the word out so people understand where to go so that, that, that for this resource. And um, similar to the, you know, the, the person who came on earlier to talk about Riverside Drive um, hasn't participated, but this is a, probably a good um, resource for um, neighborhood. So I don't know if Angie, you had any ideas about what you know what you were thinking, or it's just more that you'd like to <clears throat> um, maybe this group to sort of take it and run with it and distribute it to all their networks. Um, so. Yeah, I can comment on that, and thank you for including it in the agenda. I'm very happy that the um, DPW has kind of integrated it into the um, traffic calming page that they have on their site. Um, and I think when we were first discussing this through this committee, um, I think it was last winter or the winter prior, um, Devin Bruce had an idea about, you know, really connecting this to TPC, um, having some sort of like small postcard that maybe could, this was back in the day when there were in-person meetings that you could, you know, directly hand to um, people who were coming in for public comment. 
Um, and then we also talked about distributing this through uh, city councilors and then other kind of neighborhood networks that exist uh, throughout the city and in different wards. Um, another thing that we had discussed that I think could be really relevant at this moment in time, as we're hearing from Donna, that there are supply chain issues um, and just implementation hurdles with some of the you know, more permanent uh, interventions. Like, could this committee with some funding um, provide the support to actually do some of these actions to support neighborhoods who maybe don't have the resources to you know, pull off putting something in the street and it could actually benefit the neighborhood. Some of the ideas that are a little more semi-permanent, um, you know, do require some material costs. Um, you know, things like parking a, a a trailer and then having it be a place where people could sit and you know have like an extension um, in the public right of way for you know residents on that street to gather, um, you know, play games together or and just sit. Um, so one idea was, can this committee support people who, um, you know, come in for public comment, maybe don't quite know how to best use the manual um, or navigate some of those systems. So just being a point of contact. And then maybe the next level up is, is there a possibility to receive funding from this, from some city source um, for there to be kind of an ad hoc group and I'm, I'm thinking you know Michael is doing these things with um, UMass and his students um, where actual tangible projects could be taken on um, and you know small studies not the ones that pay for engineers but um, I think we're all residents and understand what's happening and can gather information from the community and what they want and then utilize some of the kind of resources within the manual um, to develop like a pilot or a, a short-term intervention while we wait for some of these larger things. So that's kind of the idea um, beyond just having it be there. Um, and I think with anything like that, that has a lot of information because there's you know at least a dozen options plus additional resources. Sometimes that can just be overwhelming for someone to come upon and to really know what to choose. So I think this committee could serve a role in kind of um, mentoring, providing support, and if it can turn into actual tangible, you know, materials that we can store on, in a shed at, at, at the transfer station or something like that, where we can bring out materials, um, try some things out, and then, you know, put it away. Thanks, Angie. Mm -hmm. um, Randy, did you have your hand up again, or um, was that from last time? Okay. Um, Elena. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm running a few minutes late. Um, hi, Angie. It's great to see you. And thanks good for to you too. <laughs> um, about the story map and the materials. Um, I just wanted to quickly chime in and say that there, um, in terms of the funding side of things, I think um, and there's a pool of money. And since this is a public meeting, this is this goes for everyone that um, coming out of the ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, that the mayor has set aside um, $4 million for community projects as they relate to the impacts of COVID and helping our community recover from that. And so I think what we saw during the pandemic was increased speeds of traffic um, in our neighborhoods um, because there was less traffic. Um, you know, I think we can all make the case of how we've seen um, traffic patterns change and um, the desire for people to be outside, to take walks, to ride their bikes, things of that nature. Um, so the deadline is the 14th, which is just two days away. <laughs> but um, hopefully, you know, there's two sets of projects, um, one that are $10,000 and less and then $10,000 or more. Um, and so I would encourage everyone on the call to take a look at the city's website for ARPA funding. Um, it's a great opportunity um, for these pilot projects, linking it back to COVID and our recovery as a community. Um, and so that could just be one resource um, at your disposal. And thinking about, you know, engaging students in these types of things would also, um, you know, another idea for um, the funding. Thanks for sharing that.
And I just want to jump in and thank Angie for all her work putting together, um, you know, this material. I mean, a huge level of effort. Um, and, it, you know, I, I, I'm actually pleased to see the community conversation sort of taking off on traffic safety big picture, um, because I think, you know, people are talking about it in that raises the level of their own self-awareness. Um, and just a little anecdotal story, um, you know, we, we see, meaning public works and, and police see all of the different traffic calming applications that come in for all over the city. And so we've recently sort of been bombarded with um, speeding complaints up on Village Hill. Um, and Village Hill is sort of this interesting um, neighborhood and that it is a neighborhood and it is a closed system. Um, it, it's a completely closed system. It's not a cut through. Um, the people who are there uh, live there. Um, so, you know, the speeding complaints are sort of interesting in that this is an actual neighborhood problem, um, you know, neighbors and neighbors and speeding through their neighborhood. Um, so I, I think that, you know, the, the sort of public community conversation around this raises a level of awareness and maybe even like self-awareness for folks as they're driving through their own neighborhoods. Um, and, and I would suggest that, um, you know, just since we're having a conversation, I'm sitting here, like I would throw up Village Hill is like a really good place for some sort of a public um, outreach on this because it is a closed system. It's not like you're dealing with commuter traffic through Village Hill. So, um, so anyway, but, but um, thanks again, Angie, for all your work. Yes, and thank you for supporting it. I mean, Donna gave a lot of her time too to make sure that we were messaging and communicating in a language that was appropriate for the city to sanction it and um, spent a lot of time reading it so um, and supporting me. So thank you for being receptive to it. Um, and I'll just throw out there, I um, see that Alex um, Jarrett is on the um, call, but a lot of the counselors, including Alex, um, have, um, List serves um, to their constituents, so um, that might be a good place to just sort of do a um, you know broad based based distribution of this of the manual. And as sort of as Donna said, you know the the more people who see mm -hmm. sort of what people are thinking about in terms of that, then um, um, maybe there will be some of that sort of internal <laughs> self-evaluation um, about um, some of these issues. So um, I, that's um, certainly a starting place to get um, the word out. Yeah, I just want to jump in and, and appreciate everybody's comments, and especially John is talking about the community conversation, because uh, I do think that is a big part of, the, of it is kind of raising awareness about safety and, and what can be done. But also before you get to your updates, I have to jump off the call. Am I gonna screw up the quorum if I leave, Carolyn? <clears throat> um, uh, well, um, we have a total of, no, we'll be down to four. You'll still be okay. <laughs> okay. I'll hurry up and run through my comments. How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> we only have five minutes, but I, I okay. guess I can keep the Zoom running. <laughs> well, I don't know that there are any votes necessarily be taken, but I'll run, I'll zip through my project update for you. Okay. <laughs> um, can so, can I before you shift gears? Can I put forward a, a question or request for the committee, maybe to decide on, just based on Elena's comment, to perhaps take advantage of the ARPA funding. Um, I guess my my question or proposal would be: Would the committee be um, open to supporting that? I, I'm happy to to look into it, try to do some of the lifting of of creating a narrative. But of course, having the bike and ped committees um, backing and support for that would be, I think, pretty critical and also you know support um, the application. So I I don't know one if there's anybody in the committee who wants to support working on some of that, or two just um, if they would if you're if the committee would review and provide their um, stamp of approval and support for being a part of that. So I think in terms of getting formal support, um, it can't be done through email or outside of the meeting. So I'm not Object. sure that, you know, since That's there's possible. not a proposal, yep. yeah, it might, it would probably, it would be 
the timeline is too short, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. That's okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Yep. In terms of um, informal support, can are we allowed to uh, help Angie to edit an application? Um, it, as individuals, absolutely, but just not as a formal sort of bike ped, um, yeah. you know, co-authored kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Because right. yeah. yeah, and that's fine. And maybe there's a place for for me to just. Um, put forward a proposal and if funding is granted I could bring it to the next meeting to say would the bike and ped committee receive this funding to support I don't know you know something right. we yeah. can think of some way mm -hmm. to formalize it after the fact okay. feel yep. free to email me Angie if you need okay. help editing thanks Brett I may have time I may not okay <laughs> Um, so just um, current project update, uh, picture Main Street, we're still, I think we've la uh, passed the last hurdle um, for MassDOT to go ahead and schedule the 25% design public hearing. Um, we think that at this point now it's going to be early November, we still don't have a date on that. So um, stay tuned because as soon as we get the date, it'll be posted everywhere. Um, um, and basically the, the delay is just the mass DOT trying to um, sort of resolve um, conflicting um, internal conflicts with um, some of the issues. So um, that's moving forward. Rocky Hill Greenway um, construction, you all may remember that we had um, directed spending, congressional spending, put forward towards this project. So that's the connector from um, Route 10 to um, um, Route 66. Uh, and so we have a schedule now, it looks like the, um, the plan is to advertise, go to advertising um, for construction in May, um, 2023. Um, not much of an update, a prospect place, Prospect Avenue basically is the sidewalk construction along where um, Valley CDC is proposing to renovate the former nursing home into 63 units of affordable housing. Um, they've actually filed their application with the planning board. It will start the public hearing process at the end of October, October 27th. Um, so part of that includes the design for that sidewalk connector that will then lead to a crosswalk allowing um, access to the back side of Jackson Street School um, through neighborhood streets. Um, Connecticut River Trail, um, that's moving forward in the 10% design phase. There was, you may have seen in the paper that there was a meeting in Hatfield public forum about the support for the connection all the way to Elm Court in Hatfield. Um, it's not clear that there's um, consistent support for that. So we're just sort of taking it um, bit by bit and um, still moving ahead with our design phase. The VHB is working on, has done survey. We're sort of looking at alignments and they're working towards at least the part that goes up to the Northampton line. Um, but we'll still be um, pushing for support um, to go to Elm Court so it can be put on the tip for actual um, trail construction, um, bike path construction. Um, I put Rocky Hill Greenway on here twice, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, next item is, you may know that we had a Shared Streets grant um, um, approved for two items, two sort of pieces of equipment. One was a bike shelter um, for downtown and the other was um, sort of a small um, piece of um, plow equipment for downtown um, sidewalks. So we'll go to the parking division. So we're right now sort of, about, we have about $10,000 for the bike shelter. So we're, we don't know yet um, what kind of shelter that kind of, that money can, um, um, be used to acquire. We're looking at potential locations um, at either the back of um, Pulaski Park or potentially in front of Urban Outfitters, sort of both of those um, bus station uh, near the bus stops, um, stop locations. So it would be helpful, I think, for um, um, people on the committee if there are any ideas 
or actual products that they know of that are in the ten thousand dollar range that um, might be appropriate in those locations. You know, we need to be mindful in Pulaski Park that it's not the design isn't overwhelming and taking um, away from the visual context of the park. Um, but um, we're in the process of trying to get um, quotes from different companies that so we can uh, um, purchase that piece of equipment. So I might put that, um, I guess just put your thinking caps on and if you have ideas of um, product and um, where we might look for that, um, that would be helpful. Um, and then um, before I go into construction, Elena, did you have a comment about the bike shelter? Brett actually has his hand, physical hand up. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. He wants to go Thanks. first. I would just say that um, you have 10, you know, you, we have $10,000 there. Uh, I would put energy towards fundraising in the community. If you found something that was $15,000 and we needed 5,000 to close the gap. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I know that the city has been successful in, in the past in things like Cracker Barrel Alley, I think, used a crowdsourcing. Uh, anyway, so yep. that's something that I would personally be willing to help with and perhaps the rest of the committee as well, we'll see. But okay. so I, Yeah, I, that's I, a good I, comment. Part of it is we'd have a timeline issue, you know, because um, we can't order if we don't have the funding in hand and then there's a supply chain thing. And if we don't get it accomplished by the grant, <laughs> end of the grant cycle, but I appreciate that. That's a, that's a good thought to keep in mind. Elena? Yeah, I wanted to one hear from the committee what their thoughts were about the lo proposed location. So you had mentioned at the bottom of Pulaski Park, but then also in front of Urban Outfitters. Um, I know maybe another location that could be floated would be the parking lot um, by Iconica Social Club, um, because that you know I know there's some challenges with Pulaski Park and how it was designed. Um, we don't want to like ruin that design, which I totally appreciate, but also thinking about that, that is a main bus hub. If people could be parking their bikes in that parking lot and crossing the street to hop on the bus, I think to a second point is that a bike shelter is one thing. And then the most important thing is secure bike parking. So while it's a nice to have, to have a roof over your bike, I think being able to lock it in a cage and feel good about leaving your bike for eight hours while you're you know, taking a bus to a different location. Um, we really wanna think about that network connectivity of riding your bike to the bus stop and then hopping on the bus to go to your final destination. Um, and then I think um, another point that um, I actually didn't realize this until talking to someone recently is that Sheldon Field I think has has bike lockers. Um, I don't know how much they're used. Um, I used to park every once in a while, drive my car down there and then take the bus to UMass. Um, and I had no idea that there were bike lockers there. And I, I would be curious to know if the city has any intel on how often they're used and if they're frequently used and maybe suggest, you know, looking into that and seeing if it's a, a possibility to actually move those um, into downtown so that they're used more frequently. Um, so those are just my few thoughts. Thanks. Um, yeah, those bike collectors have been there for a while. We had some downtown um, that we certainly we wanted secure um, parking there because it's out of view. There's not a lot of um, foot traffic or traffic during the day. So it was important to have um, that there, but they haven't been, and we did a lot of um, outreach when they first arrived and we didn't get a lot of takers um, for those, but um, I think it's still an option um, as a secondary option, as opposed to moving it downtown, but we'll, um, uh, so that's all I have to say about that, but we'll certainly look at options, um, all the various pricing options for, uh, and, management options for um, bike shelters in in downtown um okay so if there are no comments on that i can go on to sort of construction projects um these i can blow through pretty quickly some of them haven't started and some of them are finished so 
Um, Florence Center is just about complete. There's some punch list items. I don't know if all the signage has been put up, but that was sort of at the end of the, um, I haven't been up there in a couple of weeks, so I don't know exactly where they are on that piece, but I know they were, that was coming to a close um, by the end of the construction season this, this um, fall. Leonard Street um, has not begun because it's the same contractor who is working on the Pleasant Street project. And um, as you all may know, we had an unforeseen um, utility, um, water utility problem um, at the end of Con uh, Pleasant Street uh, by Service Center, which um, took out a section of new pavement on Pleasant Street. So we had to sort of, um, there was a delay there, but um, we now have a solution for the water line repair. And so I think that's gonna move forward next week, which will allow Pleasant Street to finish and um, get wrapped up and get line painting on, which has been um, a problem with people driving through there, not knowing that there are actually curbs in the roadway and um, has caused lots of, um, um, tire issues with cars without that striping and notification. So as soon as Pleasant, basically Ludlow Construction is also doing um, on tap to do Leonard Street. So that's what the holdup on Leonard Street is because it's the same contractor. Um, Laurel Street's pretty much finished up. Um, and I just have the Bridge Street and Bridge Road PVTA project. I don't know how much you all were involved or aware of that, but um, PVTA, this is all funded through PVTA. There was a bike shelter, a bus shelter, sorry, put on Bridge Street. Um, it does not meet ADA um, um, spacing requirement. So it is going, PVTA is actually going to move it to Bridge Road in front of the former nursing home where Valley CDC um, project will be. So there's already a pad there ready to receive the bike shelter and it just physically has to get moved from um, Bridge Street to Bridge Road. Um, and that will um, close out that um, piece of it. Um, and the Bridge Street bridge, uh, bike path bridge lighting project, we finally um, were able to find resources to to um, meet the contract with the lowest bidder for the contract for that. There are supply chain issues. So this is gonna be a much longer rollout than we had thought, um, but we do have the contractor lined up and he's starting to place the orders for the, the bridge light, underbridge lighting on Main Street. So that is moving forward and we're all, we're just at the mercy of um, equipment and supplies for that installation. Um, King Street, as you um, probably are aware, the striping is going down. So that project is, is nearing completion, but not quite there yet. I don't know what the timeline on that is. And, um, Donna may have a better sense of that, but I, um, but you all are sort of seeing that in real time. Um, and then finally, I have the North King roundabout. I don't know if this was, I think this was in the paper, but DOT has basically um, spent the last year and a half or so looking at potential alternatives based on the fact that there was a concern raised about um, <clears throat> impact to um, uh, historic um, Native American resources in the um, that vicinity, they have um, come up with an alternative design that's still a roundabout, but has um, pulls the um, right of way <clears throat> expansion closer into the existing right of way, and they're ready to move forward um, on that process. So it basically essentially starts the process over again to the 25% design phase, but they are moving forward. They feel like this is a very important project for safety and that um, you know the, round, the layout of the roundabout is within essentially the existing layout of the street. So um, that should, should address the um, concerns of that, that were raised by the abutters um, relative to um, expanding that into um, previously um, 
for, uh, forested area. Um, and that's it for my construction wrap up. Um, so I don't know if there's anything else that anyone wants to talk about or any questions about those projects to be happy to field. Brett, go for it. Regarding the touchy roundabout subject, um, if planning feels that it would be helpful for this committee to do outreach and education to make sure that people know that it's a different project and a different, you know, it's, it's been shifted um, appropriately, uh, please let us know. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think that's gonna be critical. We'll definitely need to have, um, you know, this committee, PPC sort of um, all the, bike safety advocates really to be at the table for that public hearing to um, really press for this change because it really is um, a dangerous intersection. And, um, and frankly, that's why DOT is pushing this forward because it really needs to be addressed. And um, the roundabout is the safest way to, um, to address that. And DOT has acknowledged that through their analysis. Um, so yeah, that would be, that's, that would be great. All right. Any other comments before we close out? Brett, you're muted. Thanks. Click almost on the button. Um, the next step on that roundabout project is the 25% hearing. So you don't have a date for that, but you will let us know when you do. Is that the is that sort of the next step? Um, yes, but I think it's next step pretty far out. Like it's not okay. imminently this fall. Okay. In fact, I I need to find out exactly when what their timeline is. When I spoke to the person at District Two in the summer, they said they wanted to do some kind of meeting in August. Um, to let the community know that this was back on the table. And then they sort of pulled back on that. So I'm not, I, I need to find out sort of what they're thinking. But yes, I, I'll definitely keep you guys apprised of that. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate your work. Yep. All right. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, good to see you all. And we'll see you at the next one.